Welcome back everyone to week four of Breaking Bread. I just have to say it again, I'm still mildly disappointed that this isn't the Breaking Bad series. Uh, and you might wonder like, what, why would I even think this would happen? I don't know. Brian watches all of his TV on VidAngel, so I just kind of assumed that he thought it was a show about a guy who gets cancer and ends up buying a car wash. I, I know, I was debating on telling him, but come to find out, it's Breaking Bread. And uh, the reason why we're doing a series about breaking bread is because really life happens over the dining table. In fact, when you celebrate, you eat. When you're depressed, you eat. When you're bored, you eat. Like the only times that we're not eating is when we're anxious or we're disgusted. Now, as the dad of a two-year-old and a one-year-old, I am losing a ton of weight right now. Uh, my anxiety and my disgust, it's through the roof. So, uh, you know, kind of lucky on that end. Now here's the thing I kind of think about when it comes to like the meals that I remember, like the significant meals of my life, it doesn't have to necessarily be from a high-end restaurant. In fact, more often than not, the meals that I remember are the ones where I had great conversation with great people. It's, it's conversation and it's people, right? So as I think back on just what are the meals that I remember, like right after I graduated high school, my dad sits me down uh, over dinner and he says to me, Matt, your mom and I, our obligation to raise you is over. <laughs> I'll tell you, like, it ended up being like a, this whole relationship is going to be built on love and respect and all that kind of stuff. It was no longer under uh, obligation and, and all that. Uh, but that sticks with me. The time my dad told me, like, hey, it's time to be an adult. I think about the time when I was 21 and my friend calls me and says, hey, I've got like a 10 hour layover overnight at LAX. And so I drove down and we went to the In-N-Out right next door and we ordered four by fours. And at 11 o'clock at night, I ate a four by four and did not feel it the next day. I mean, that was a significant meal. I think about the time that Pastor Brian and Jeff Craig took me out to the Wood Ranch in Anaheim Hills and they sit down and they say, hey, we really want you to be part of the Cross Point team. I think about the other time when I took my then uh, uh, father-in-law uh, of the future out to dinner to ask him for the blessing to marry my now wife, Jen. And uh, what we decided was we were going to go to a place, you know, with the killer wings and the animal with the big eyes and, and the wings. Um, spoiler, Buffalo Wild Wings. I think I, uh, think I got you there for a second. Um, and uh, I sat across the table and said, you know, would you bless... Uh, would you bless me in marrying your daughter? And he said, yes. I mean, these are the types of meals that they stick with me. It was, it was the people and it was the conversation. Now, even to this day, like I'd still say I love food, but I don't consider myself a foodie. I mean, it's just recently I found out like there's a huge difference between the loaves of bread I used to buy for a dollar when I was a bachelor and the loaves of bread my wife buys, it's like four or five bucks. Like there's a huge difference between the two, but despite all the growth I've had in my own personal tastes, uh, I'd still say that my favorite restaurant is Taco Bell. And I know I feel a lot of judgment coming through the screen right now. So we're like, ah, Taco Bell, are you kidding me? Like that is fake Mexican food. Guys, Batman is fake too. And that doesn't bother me. So I don't know why this would bother me either. But here's something I'm kind of learning about myself. As I get older, as I venture later into my 30s, uh, my body does not react to Taco Bell the way that it used to. Like, I eat it now, and it's like I've got a headache the rest of the day. I, I find myself just kind of asking, like, why did I do this uh, to myself once again? But here's something I've learned, is that over the course of time, I find myself crazy, craving Taco Bell again. And don't you find yourself in the same position, maybe not with Taco Bell, but with, with other parts of your life where you end up finding yourself craving the things that make you sick? All right, today uh, I wanna tell you about a meal that was really special between Jesus and one of his disciples. But before I even do, I just need to give you a little bit of context. You know, in our, in our New Testament, we have four accounts of Jesus's life. And if you were to read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're gonna find right off the bat that the first three are very similar. They kind of follow the same, uh, the same structure. It's all the same story, but uh, they, they're using a lot of the same stories and teachings and uh, telling a lot of the same details from Jesus's life. And then you get to the book of John and it's different. And in fact, if, if John were going to follow the same structure that the other three followed, you'd, you'd get to the end of chapter 20 and you'd say, hey, this book is over. But John decides, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna write the 21st chapter. And I gotta think about was John sat down to, to write his account of Jesus's life. As he, as he stops to say like, I wanna tell my perspective and my angle and the things that I saw 
through Jesus' teachings and through Jesus' miracles. Like he was writing at a time where the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed. The church was under heavy persecution. John was probably the last eyewitness to Jesus' miracles and to his resurrection. And he sits down and he says, I want to write my perspective. And despite all the things that maybe are stacked up against the church, it's flourishing. Followers of the way are now numbering in the tens, if not the hundreds of thousands of people. But yet John still says at the end of chapter 20, there's one more story I need to tell. I can't let this one be forgotten. And one of the reasons why the church was flourishing was because of a guy by the name of Peter. And Peter, he was part of the original 12. He was an early leader in the church, and he was one of the first to build a bridge from the Jewish world to the Roman and Gentile world. But at the point that John sits down to write his book, Peter is already dead. And the three existing accounts, they all tell of Peter's absolute worst moment of his life. And John says, there's still one more story I need to tell you. Before I tell you that one, I need to tell you about this one. So one day, Peter and his brother, Andrew, are, are out on the boat, and they've been fishing all night, and they didn't catch anything. And so as they bring their boat to shore, they, they go through their end-of-day routine where they start to mend and fix their nets, when all of a sudden this large crowd starts moving closer and closer to the shore. And they find out the reason why is because the rabbi, Jesus, who attracts crowds wherever he goes, has decided to pick this part of the shoreline to teach the crowds. And so Jesus actually walks up to Peter and he says, hey, do you mind if I, if I take your boat out? And so Peter, you know, flattered, says, sure. And they get into the boat and they cast off. And Jesus sits there and he teaches the crowd from the boat. And Peter just sits there and he absorbs it all and he, he witnesses just the authority, that Jesus teach with, the, the authority that Jesus teaches with. When at the end of his teaching, Jesus says, hey, do you want to try fishing one more time? And this is a ridiculous proposal because, you know, fish don't catch, uh, you can't catch fish in the middle of the day. In fact, the reason why they would fish all night was because the fish would swim to the, uh, the shallower parts of the water when the, when the night was cool, and then they would retreat to the depths when the sun would come out and get so much hotter. And so for Jesus to say in that moment, hey, do you want to catch fish right now? This was this is a ridiculous proposition. But something pushes Peter and he says, okay, I'll try this. And so he and his brother, they throw their nets over the side and as they start to pull them back up, rather than being greeted by just the ease of an empty net pulling right back into the boat, there's some tension. And they start to pull and they realize that this is the greatest catch they've ever had in their entire lives. Then as the nets start to break, they start to pull into the boat and Jesus says to them, you guys are excellent fishermen but I want to make you fishers of men. I want you to drop your nets and follow me. And Peter did. He said, I'm going to follow Jesus. And so he walked away from his successful career as a fisherman and starts to follow Jesus. And as he does this, he has a front row seat to Jesus's miracles and his teachings. In fact, at one point, Jesus is walking along with his disciples and he had, he had had quite a reputation in that day and age. And he turns to them and he says, uh, hey, who, who do people say that I am? Like, what is the word on the street for for who people think that I am. And Peter st stands up and he says, I think you're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're, you're the son of God. And Jesus says to him, Simon, son of Jonah, you didn't come up with this on your own. In fact, God has told you. Your name is Simon, but I'm gonna change it to Peter because Simon means like pebble, but Peter, it means bolder. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And then immediately, Jesus takes him and James and John up on top of a mountain. And Jesus transfigures. And you actually start to see his glory start to manifest itself. And he, he starts to transform into this heavenly creature. And Peter has a front row seat to all of this. But what happens is the night that Jesus is betrayed, they're having one final meal. And Jesus actually looks over at Peter at one point and he says, Peter, I need to tell you something. You know, Satan, he's, he's asked my father if he can sift you like wheat. In fact, some scholars have taken that and said that there's quite possibly a chance that, that Jesus was saying that Satan was asking that Peter could sit in Judas' seat as the one who would betray Jesus. But Jesus says, I've actually prayed on your behalf that this wouldn't happen. And so Peter, he hears this and he thinks, man, I, I, that's just not consistent with my character. That's not me. I, I would never betray you. And he says to Jesus, 
Jesus, I would go to prison for you. I would die for you. And Jesus has to look at Peter in that moment and say, no, Peter. In fact, even before this night is over, you're going to betray me. Like, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny that you even know me. Three times before even the rooster crows. And then that night, Jesus is betrayed, and he's arrested, and he's, he's taken to the court, and Peter follows along at a distance, and he sneaks into the inner courtyard, and he sees this group of people warming themselves by a fire, and he makes his way over, and he's sitting there, and he's processing probably just all the events from the last day and everything that's happened when this girl starts staring at him and, like, shooting daggers through him with her eyes. So finally, she speaks up, and she says, I'm pretty sure you're a Galilean, and you've been, you've been following Jesus. Are you one of his followers? And maybe caught off guard and just having a knee-jerk reaction, Peter says, no, I, I, don't, I don't know the man. And then somebody else is like, no, I'm pretty sure I've seen you with Jesus. Are you sure you're not one of his followers? And Peter, at this point, it's no longer being caught off guard or just a knee-jerk reaction. Like, this is premeditated. He starts to declare, no, I, I, I've, never, I've never been a part of his inner circle. I don't know him. I don't like him. So he starts to curse, saying like, hey, God can kill me if I'm wrong. And eventually a third person pipes in and says, no, I'm pretty sure that you're one of Jesus' followers. And at this point, he's like manic, just, just cursing and just swearing that he's not one of Jesus' followers and then immediately, a rooster starts to crow. Peter turns his head and he locks eyes with Jesus. And he realizes that he denied him. He's betrayed the relationship and the friendship and he ducks his head in disgrace and he runs away. And of course, that night, Jesus was about to embark on one of the most humiliating portions of his life as the guards blindfold him and they start to hit him and they ask him, like, who hit you, Jesus? Prophesy, who hit you? And of course, they scourge him. They mock him. They force him to carry his cross up the hill. They nail his hands and his feet into the beams, and he dies. And Peter's final encounter with Jesus before that moment was denying that he even knew him. And of course, Jesus doesn't stay dead. They lay his body in the tomb, and three days later, he comes back. And over the course of 40 days, he starts to visit and meet with some of his followers, Peter included, but there's still this underlying tension. And so as John is surveying the world as he's writing his account, he knows that the other three have shared that story about Peter's life. He says, there's still one more story that you need to know. So Peter and a few of the other disciples, they make their way from Jerusalem back up to Galilee. And Peter says this. He says, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to the boat. Now, there's debate on whether or not this was just him deserting following God or if this was uh, just a way of maybe passing the time as they waited for further instructions from God. But I want you to lean in and think about this. After one of Peter's worst moments, in a time when he's made his biggest mistake, his instinct was to go back to normal, back to comfortable. He starts craving the things that he used to do before Jesus called him out of that boat. And I got to believe that there's still that lingering memory in his mind of those final moments. And this is one of the things between shame and and guilt. See, guilt is when I feel bad for things that I've done. Shame is when I feel bad for who I am. Like, you can dismiss some of your individual actions, but to dismiss your very character and your very essence, well, that's tough. And so Peter is out on the boat that day, and it's actually a very similar experience for him. As he casts his nets down, and he starts to pull them back up. There's nothing. And they swim to another part of the water and they drop their nets outside of the boat and they start to pull them up and it's nothing until eventually a guy from the shore starts to yell out at him. And he says, why don't you cast your net on the other side? So Peter, he throws his net to the other side and he starts to pull it back up. 
and there's that familiar feel. The tension is back. The nets are full and they start to pull it in. It's the largest catch they've ever had in their entire lives. And they pull it in and suddenly uh, John, who's on the boat as well, says, hey, I think that's Jesus. And Peter, who apparently had been fishing the whole night, just completely naked, is like, man, Jesus is here? I better put a shirt on. So he throws on his tunic and he, he actually jumps into the water and he swims back to the shore. And for 300 feet, he's, he's making his way back to the banks of the Sea of Galilee. And I'm sure he's having this memory just play through his mind of his final interaction with Jesus before he was killed and crucified. I mean, how could he not? Like, how could these memories not be flooding his mind? And here he was, back in the boat, maybe craving the thing that, that always made him sick. And you get this. I mean, some of us, we've been going through the last, you know, two, three months, and the COVID blues have started to set in, and you told yourself, yeah, I know I've been sober for the last couple of years, but it just feels comfortable. It just feels right right now. And you relapsed. Or maybe you had left a world of an addiction to pornography and you found yourself recently going right back to the mess. Maybe you've lost your job and you used to have a career long ago, but you didn't like the person that you became when you did that kind of work, but you find yourself now maybe venturing back into that same career because it just feels natural and it feels normal. You, you said, I, I'm going back to what feels comfortable in the moment. And so what happens is Peter, he swims to shore and he starts to have a conversation with Jesus. And I got to love this about God, that the same place that, that Jesus called Peter out of the boat, he meets, him with, meets with him again after this great failure in his life. And as he's on the shore, there's a fire smoldering. In fact, because it's the beginning of the day, the roosters are crowing. And I'm sure that memories are flooding Peter's memory. Like he's thinking about all of the different things. And between Jesus and Peter, there's just this underlying tension that they haven't dealt with it. They haven't talked about it. And maybe you know what this feels. It's like sitting next to that person that you owe money to that you've never actually paid back. It's, it's being with that person that, that you've slandered and they know what you've said, but you've never actually addressed the tension. It's it's being with that friend that you've already asked out, his ex-girlfriend, and you just know that there's something between you that you're just not going to be able to overcome without talking about it. And we know that in these, in these situations where it's, uh, maybe it's not extreme abuse, but the victim holds the power. Jesus holds the power in this moment. And so it says in John 21, and starting at verse 15, it says that after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. But one time wasn't enough. It says in verse 16, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And a third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times now. Jesus has asked him the same question. Do you love me? It actually says that Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Now, I think one of the easiest ways to read a passage like this is to say, well, uh, Peter denied Jesus three times, and so he needs to perform penance. He needs to say he loves him three times, almost like, you know, Jesus is your dad. And Peter's like, oh, man, dad, do I have to? Like, that's, that's how we might want to read this, but that's not what's happening here at all. In fact, Here's what I believe is happening, is Jesus is saying the number three in your life, it needs to lose its power. It needs to lose its power in your memory. You need to know that we are writing a new story here. That I saw you in the boat and I called you out of it. And today I saw you in the boat again. And I'm not going to leave you there to punish you. I'm calling you back out. 
See, I believe God doesn't promote failure, but he meets us there. See, I believe that as God is looking at the GPS of our life, he's looking at the roadmap for where he's taking us, he's not planning on the detours, but sometimes the detours can become our destinations. See, what God is doing, what Jesus is doing here on the shoreline that day is he's teaching Peter, you don't have what it takes, but with me, you will. In fact, God is using his failure to teach him that humility is going to be essential to his ministry. And it's like in John 21, the author John is saying, I, I can't let this story disappear. You need to know that God is not holding grudges toward you. He called you out of the boat, and even if you go back to it, he wants to call you out of it again. As I read something like this and really study it, I, I'm always drawn to Romans 8, 38 through 39 that says this, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Some of you have been beating yourselves up for the last several years because you changed your life and then you went right back to the mess. And you think that God's given up on you. That God has said no, like you got one chance and you blew it. And you find yourself years maybe decades later, struggling with the idea that God could still love you in spite of your mess. But I have to promise you this, the same God who stood on the shoreline that day and invited Peter back into the conversation is standing on the shoreline of your life right now and inviting you back into the conversation, saying maybe we need to have a breakfast right now where we get it all on the table and we just kind of own the fact that mistakes were made, but I'm not holding a grudge. I love you. And nothing can separate you from Christ's love. See, what happens from there in Peter's life is that he wasn't kept on the sideline. In fact, Peter stands on the day of Pentecost and gives a sermon where the church actually is launched. 3,000 people decide to become followers of Jesus because of what Peter said on that day. And not because Peter was, was this excellent human being, but because God was willing to use him. Throughout his life, he made mistake after mistake. He said the wrong thing when he shouldn't have. He did the wrong thing when he shouldn't have. But God was saying, it's not through your power that I'm going to change the world. It is through me using you. Some of you need a breakfast with Jesus this morning. You need it today. You need an opportunity to sit down and have him tell you, I love you. I haven't given up on you. I can still use you. Hey, I want to pray for you right now. I know that some of you, you walked away from God a long time ago. And for some reason, you decided to tune in to a live stream like this. And you were debating whether or not this was even something that applied because you thought maybe you had your chance. I just want to promise you, God wants a relationship with you. Some of you, you've never started a relationship with God. This, all is, some, this is all something that, that you've kind of been working through and wrestling. You just feel like there might be something to it, but you're not necessarily willing to, to commit. I'm just telling you right now, that voice that you're hearing, that is the Holy Spirit calling you into a relationship. And so I want to invite you, no matter where you're at today, whether you're in your bedroom, you're in your living room, whether you're listening to this in your car, whether you're watching this even months or years from now, Today, make it official. Let's pray. God, I want to pray for those who are engaging in this right now that, that have never started a relationship with you, that God, that, that you would just kind of yell out to them and bring them back to the shore. That God, that, that you would put this prayer on their lips, that God, I'm in desperate need of you. That God, that I need you to forgive me of my sins and take full control of my life. God, I'm asking you to be the boss, the coach, and the CEO of who I am. God, I'm also praying for those who maybe made a commitment a long time ago that walked away. 
But God, you would remind them that your mercies are never failing, that nothing can separate them from your love. And that God, that you're willing to re-engage them. That God, that you're willing to have a relationship with them despite their past. So God, we pray this all in your son's name. Amen.